this next panel, which is another one of the panels that we've been doing every year at the USAIC Healthcare Summit, and that's our oncology panel. And this year we have a, an amazing moderator in Jay Bradner. Jay Bradner is a, a prototype physician scientist, entrepreneur. Um, Jay is just stepping down after a very successful um, multi-year tenure as the head of the Hollowed uh, Institute at, at Novartis, Nibber, uh, where he led the R&D organization. Jay um, is has started five biotech companies. He continues to see patients. He teaches. Um, he teaches ac ac in, in students and 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 uh, and residents, and he also teaches all of us in many ways. And Jay, as as many of us in, in the industry, has demonstrated immense resiliency, but none more so than this week when his Bruins who were the best hockey team in the history of the NHL, lost in Game 7 in the first round of the playoffs. So, Jay, I'm glad to see that you've bounced back after that loss. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Andy. We can uh, commiserate um, with your Islanders at the appropriate time. Um, Haroon, uh, Andy, um, and colleagues, thanks so much for another totally spirited um, and incisive summit, our 17th. Uh, just blown away all day today by the engagement. Um, participation in the attendance of such a meeting. Welcome to the oncology panel. Uh, we're joined here today um, by real experts advancing the bleeding edge of science and industry in the academy, in pharma and in biotech. We have with us today Elise Ryson, the Chief Executive Officer of Tectonic Therapeutics, Frank Nestle, the Global Head of Research and the Chief Scientific Officer of Sanofi, Kathy Seidel, the Vice President and Head of the Oncology Drug Discovery Unit at Takeda, Katie Rizvani, Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Section of Cellular Therapy, Director of Translational Research at um, America's largest cancer center, uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Rohan Verji, the co-founder and CEO of Proceed Biosciences, a new co, focusing on enabling precision medicine through a next generation liquid biopsy platform technology that I and others just can't wait to hear about, um, hear more about. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for uh, being with us here today. Let's open this panel up with a softball over the middle of the plate. Um, as you reflect on all that you've seen in your own shop at the ACR, out on the savanna of biotechnology, um, to your mind, what is the most promising um, investigational therapy or new mechanism or new technology? And we'll go around and ask everybody, Katie, let's start with you. Okay, well, of course I'm biased. So I am going to say for me, uh, cell therapy certainly seems to um, have the one of the greatest potentials that I see for um, treatment of cancer. That potential has been um, um, fulfilled at least somewhat in um, hematologic malignancies, but I do um, believe that that potential will also be fulfilled in the setting of solid tumors as we understand more the biology and use the tools that are available to us to uh, manufacture the next generation of cell therapies. All right, well, we'll double click on that in a moment. Frank, what's your perspective? Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Jay. Uh, uh, greetings from Paris. I, I, would, I would like to pick smart biologics it addresses the question, what if you turn a biologic like an antibody from a monospecific binder with a passive distribution pharmacology into an intentionally designed molecule with attributes like multi-specificity, uh, designed PK, targeted tissue di distribution. Uh, one of those molecules we have currently in early clinical trials is a precision activated T cell engager. It's a technology platform where you engage T cells, but you do it with a mask attached with the protease cleavable linker. And this mask comes off only in the tumor and that avoids CRS, um, which is obviously a, a major blockade for, for appropriate dosing in, in cancer patients and hopefully gets us to a better uh, safety and efficacy profile. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, so, so thanks for having me, Jay. It's really great to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I have to say a similar answer to Frank um, in terms of, of biologics. Uh, we have um, some very interesting uh, cell engager biologics that we're pretty excited about. 
that are conditional uh, CD3 activated molecules. Uh, and these, again, we're hoping for that better therapeutic index, uh, which in preclinical studies um, held out to be the case. Um, and so these kinds of drugs with uh, a better safety profile should allow us to have less uh, CRS and be safer for, for patients and be able to go after targets that have been a bit more challenging uh, because of their uh, broader expression. All right. A growing consensus. Brown, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to deviate and be also a little bit self-interested here, uh, which is probably a good thing. I guess we should all be working on things that we're sort of innately passionate about. Uh, gives it the best chance of being successful. Um, I, I'm really interested, honestly, in a lot of the technology that's emerging that looks like it's going to enable us to detect disease much earlier, better define, I think, the disease biology minimally invasively, and perhaps track, I think, the evolution of disease biology more precisely so that we can take wonderful medicines and rather than testing them empirically, actually, you know, get them to the right patients at the time when you can sort of, you know, achieve potentially the best outcome. Uh, and I think the last decade, there's been so much progress. There's obviously a lot more, a lot more to come, I hope, but there's some really interesting technology out there that's sort of developing at this stage. Great. More on that for sure in a moment. Elise, what have you seen out there? I wish I was going to be a contrarian, but I think it sounds like we're going to have a lot on the immune system. And then my second choice would have been where Rehan went. So I also, I think we're in the early stages of cellular therapy. Um, and we're just starting to see the potential. Yesterday, there was a press release about uh, TCR approach to um, solid tumors. There was over a 60% response rate, unclear if you had durability, but even getting that was super exciting. And then I think you start to think about access because that's an issue. And, and where are we with the allo gene, you know, allo um, CAR T? Certainly getting high response rates, but the persistence isn't there. But I'm getting starting to get excited about second generation that hopefully will overcome the persistence piece. And then I know it's an oncology panel, but I have to mention CAR T and the immunology space because there's super exciting preliminary data there as well. Well, thanks. Um, just so that there's fair representation, as a chemist, I would add that there's been just an absolute revolution in our capacity to engage, modulate, degrade, selectively inhibit, allele specifically inhibit targets that for 40 years have been beyond the reach of therapeutic discovery, um, whether it's you know covalent chemoproteomics or molecular glues. And secondarily, I really start to admire the way a very small group of drug developers in our field are going earlier with precision prevention, because that unfortunately, given the heterogeneity of this disease in most patients is where we're gonna need to be. All right, um, let's move on. Um, so um, let's, let's open the discussion with immuno-oncology. I apologize to anybody if this, these opinions seem provocative, but I'm just back in the clinic again after seven years being away, and I guess I had expected more uh, from the contribution of the amazing medicines we read about every morning in Fierce Biotech and Endpoints. Um, why is the next generation of immuno-oncology medicines taking so damn long? Why are these medicines so underperforming? It was Coley in 1891 until CTLA-4 in 2011, PD-1 in 2014, and then it went quiet and has for a while, and it's not for lack of investment, and it's not for lack of trying, massive biotech and NIH investment with actually very few emerging agents. And I can only think of one or two that have a shred of single agent activity. So Kathy, let's please start with you. How have on-treatment biomarkers that we've all systematically obtained on these studies failed to yield actionable insights, and what can we do to correct? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. Um, of course, biomarkers have led to many improved response rates and more durable uh, progression-free survival, and even in some cases, better overall survival. But yes, there are many trials with maybe one of the most famous recent ones in the anti-TIGIT phase three disappointing result um, from Roche Genentech. Um, and I think where we're left is that we don't really know in the IO space 
how to select our patients, right? And even in PD-1, anti-PD-1 treatment, where we can enrich for patients that, that respond, we still have some patients that in the absence of the ligand PDL one still respond to anti-PD-1. And we don't really understand why, despite, as you say, many, many efforts to try to understand different kinds of approaches, um, sequencing everything under the sun um, and looking at different proteomics and every possible measure. So it's, it's, a, it's the lack of translatability from mouse to human. A lot of these, these, this work is done in mice. And of course, there's many examples of that um, not working out. Um, and then also, I think when we are selecting our patients, we don't have enough mechanistic understanding of the therapeutics that we're using to be able to then pick the patients that are going to respond. And another maybe provocative thought that I've been considering um, with our teams here at Takeda is, is there any way that we could use exploratory biomarkers to select patients that are set within the, the strong hypothesis of the particular therapeutic that we're going after? And that's in the broad IO kind of approach. Of course, if you have something with a target, a cell surface target, or a TKI, or, or some clear handle that you can select patients based on, uh, we should be doing that. And even there, I think we could be doing a much better uh, job at, at taking a look at the overall pathways that we're going after to make sure that we are encompassing the broad mechanism of a particular therapeutic. You know, it's well said all these years later, we're still using PDL 1% probability for agents that don't really even modulate that pathway. So we have so much more to, room to move in biomarker space. Ron, to put you on the spot, um, what sort of biomarkers might we create that would better stratify patients for next generation IO therapeutics? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Kathy mentioned a really interesting trial, you know, the um, PDL1 digit trial in small cell lung cancer. And when they presented that trial, you know, the complete failure and disappointment that it was, there was a sub bullet that said, please note that transcriptional subtyping was not done in these patients. And what's really interesting is, you know, transcriptional subtyping of small cell lung cancer, you know, has been done by numerous groups, tissue-based RNA-seq, and they've all converged on a thesis that there is a group that might be driving the response to immunotherapy in patients with small cell lung cancer. And AstraZeneca sort of retrospectively validated that thesis in, in an analysis they did of their own positive trial. So, so I would argue, and it gets back to, I think, what Kathy said is, are we using all of the exploratory, exploratory tools at our disposal when we're actually doing these trials? Um, because if we're not, the risk is we run really, really quickly, we fail, and then we have no good explanation for why we failed. And the consequence is we haven't really moved the field forward other than to say, don't do the exact experiment that we did. So I, I think to me, there's a really big opportunity to use, you know, things like that. And, you know, Jay, I was very inspired by one of the companies that you founded, Ciros, where, you know, one of the strategies was to look at transcriptional dependencies. Um, and, you know, and that seemed to work. Um, but if you think about it, it's not really a, an approach that's used kind of broadly. So I guess in, in my view, I feel sometimes the competitive pressure, the urgency to act, the focus on cost, the difficulty of getting tumor biopsies has really basically posed a pretty big challenge in terms of really doing a thorough scan on exploratory biomarkers that might inform success or failure and enable us to move forward with much more clear learnings from either case. Well, it's, it's quite a... Um an insight into the state of our understanding of immuno-oncology just as a fundamental biology that we might here invoke such holistic measures, new microscope lenses to look at this same ages old problem. Let's pivot in immuno-oncology to sort of new mechanisms and new approaches. And Frank, you had invited a consideration of modular biotherapeutics, which indeed are very exciting. They're often not trivial to manufacture. Um, you've extensively studied um, NK cell engaging therapeutics modulating therapeutics. Uh, how might these sorts of therapies complement or orthogonally accompany checkpoint response and resistance and will they have single agent activity? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Jay. And uh, uh, you know, we just discussed how T cell checkpoint inhibitors might have exhausted their capability in patient population to achieve responses. And if you think about T cells as an effector cell in the spirit of Coley, you just should remember that there are other, and he was the father of cancer immunotherapy, as we probably all agree on, that there are other uh, important innate immune effectors. And it's really interesting that T cells, why they are super effective and they're endorsed um, with memory capabilities, uh, some of the few cells in the immune system which can remember uh, what, what happens, they have an Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is that they have to rec recognize a cognate antigen and they have to recognize in the context of MHC. And that makes them uh, susceptible to antigen loss and MHC loss and to all the failures we're seeing, especially then also in the post-checkpoint space. Now, in K cells have been put into place by evolution to circumvent that Achilles heel. They recognize cells, and including cancer cells, in an MHC-independent manner. And that also gives them a very practical attribute, if you use them as a cell therapy, that you can use them as a universal donor of the shelf cell therapy product. So at Sanofi, we decided a few years back to have multiple shots on goal in this space. And uh, again, coming back to the smart biologic concept, I'm most excited about what NK cell engagers can do because they have excellent drug-like properties. They, can, they could replicate what T cell engagers have done in blazing the trail and, and they might have better therapeutic indices. But you have to be humble because your NK cell compartment might not be efficient. And that's why you have to handle NK cell therapies. And we do this with a universal donor approach. And then you have to be also humble about what it takes to activate an NK cell. And you might need the appropriate cytokines, which we have also in our toolbox. So, so really getting at NK cell therapy from multiple angles, NK cell therapies, engagers, and cytokines is probably what it takes to make it successful. Now your question, single agent activity, yes. We, we, we showed in at ASH uh, two years back that in two thirds of patients with relapsed refractory AML, you get CRs or CRIs with a, uh, a donor derived um, uh, uh, in case cell product. But the big question will be, and there's a race to now get this uh, to approval in, in liquid cancer, can we move into solid cancers? And this is a whole different ball game. Uh, you have to get NK cells into solid cancer. So you have to survive the hostile tumor microenvironment. And that's a big, big frontier where we're all exploring and, and what we need to do to really make NK cells uh, the effector cell it serves to be. Katy might have some additional comments, obviously. Well, let's pivot right to that. Thanks for the segue to cellular therapies. You know, um, one thing that Glenn Dranoff used to always say to me in our one-on-ones was this current wave of so-called next-generation IO medicines are really a bunch of targets also discovered in the 80s and 90s, and it will take the discovery of new targets from on-treatment biopsy, um, I believe, to prompt a really effective next generation of IO medicines with just exactly the kind of measurements, Rahan, that you mentioned. All right, let's pivot to next generation cell therapies. And Katie, you're up next. So yes, CAR T cell therapy is now firmly established as disruptive, as to many uh, patients definitive, just celebrated another of Emily Whitehead's birthdays. Um, it's also intensely challenging. And the field has sort of lacked creativity of late, 200 thinly differentiated CD19-like therapies. And it's not proven plug and play in solid tumors but for neuroblastoma, which I just couldn't believe. It was so exciting to read. So out of the box and taking all the information that we have available to us to design the next gen generation of cell therapy. So for instance, looking at uh, what are the biomarkers of which subtype of patients are likely to, to respond using the, the tools that are available like CRISPR gene editing, in addition to the various viral vector manufacturing and, and, and um, uh, um, uh, engineering strategies that are available, and also using all the single cell omics data that are now coming through that tell us a lot about mechanisms of resistance and mechanisms of relapse. Ultimately, the product that would probably make 
really um, cell therapy's mainstay of treatment of cancer will have to be a product that is safe, that can be um, delivered to patients as at a point of care or at least available beyond um, highly specialized centers, um, a product that will also result in durable responses to patients. For that, we will end up having to use a multi, um, I think a multimodal approach of a product that's engineered, potentially combined with biologics, potentially combined with checkpoint inhibitors uh, and other immunomodulators. And I don't think we will ever have a product that will fit all because for each cancer, for each disease, those mechanisms of resistance, mechanisms of relapse are going to be very disease specific and even disease subtype specific. So we've put a lot of our effort into natural killer cells uh, and, you know, Frank very eloquently described the advantages. I don't want to belabor that point. But I think at least to my mind, having a product that is, and I know we're going to talk about access, but ultimately you want to have a product that can be scalable, that will be affordable, that will be safe, both in terms of the patient side effects, but also in terms of giving um, uh, a confidence to uh, uh, an oncologist, maybe in a, in a smaller clinic to administer it to the patient, again, reducing costs, increasing accessibility, but then will uh, result in inducing um, profound responses that will be long lived. So more so than just, for instance, a bridge to transplant, something that could potentially result in a cure in a patient. So again, looking at how can we engineer our natural killer cells using CRISPR gene editing to make them resistant to the tumor microenvironment, putting a car in there, engineering them to secrete cytokines, combining them with bispecific antibodies. We presented our data at ASH with a bispecific engager targeting CD30, where we uh, observed responses of greater than 90% in, in multiply relapsed patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. So I think all of this is feasible, but uh, a lot of science will have to go into uh, the development, both in terms of um, engineering the cells, but also the biomarkers of who is going to respond. Just one last point I would like to stress, especially for an allergenic cell therapy product, even though these cell therapy products are manufactured from a healthy donor, not all donors are the same. Not all healthy people are the same. We all have different susceptibilities, for instance, to viral infections. We have different immune systems. So also identifying the right donor allergenic donor that you will be using to manufacture 100 doses or 1,000 doses of your cell therapy product is extremely important. And I think that's something that more and more uh, people are thinking about and also we're focusing on. Love that thought about donors. You could imagine we're using a patient's T cells with clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential would be a disaster or a really good idea. Um, that's a really key insight. Elise, I know you spent a lot of time thinking about this too. Um, feel free to share reflections on next generation because I think they're linked, but I'd love to ask you about access. You've brought medicines forward in development that have reached patients all around the world. And now as a CEO, you must be working backwards from what does it look like to have a medicine that you know reaches patients? How do we democratize access? Because we have to balance the cost of preparing this medicine with its impact, but we also, for it to be a sustainable business, have to ensure that there are margins to this that don't dilute the productivity of the whole rest of the oncology portfolio. This matters not just for patients accessing medicines, but also, especially in underserved geographies, but also for drug development. Um, Katie, you just mentioned combination um, um, uh, studies. We did a combination of Kimraya with Abrutinib. It was so hard. Uh, it's hard enough to develop these as single agents. So we need to fix access for so many reasons. How will we do this, Elise? <laughs> God, I wish I could have the, the magic bullet to fixing access, but I think in the cellular therapy space, it starts getting away from auto to allo or to NK. I, I think that's really the only way you're going to significantly reduce the cost of making these. Now, they're still not going to be as cheap to make as a small molecule. I think in vivo is the other place um, that could reduce the cost, but depending on what you're using. If you're using lentiviruses for in vivo, there's still the cost of making the lentiviruses. So I think it gets you 
it gets you a significant amount of the way there. You're still going to be, they're still going to be very expensive to make. The better we can make them and the more they lead to cure, the more the value proposition is there, right? So if all getting is two or three months of progression-free survival from them, it gets a little bit harder potentially to justify the cost. But if you can really do the cure um, with them or get to really prolonged um, you know, maintenance of disease, I think you start to get there. And, and maybe it gets back to, you know, Katie started to talk about a lot of combinations. I come from an ID background initially, many, many decades ago. So, you know, it always made sense to me that you're going to have to treat oncology with multiple modalities. And, and maybe even in the CAR T space, in the cellular serotonin space, you've got to, if one of the mechanisms is you stop, the tumor stop it's expressing the antigen, you've got to be thinking about making cellular therapy that goes across two antigens on the tumor type. Um, and maybe that's the way to go. Just agree with everything you said and the framing. All right, let's pivot to targeted therapy, if it's okay. Um, one of the benefits of having this uh, magical non-compete clinical um, part of my uh, life is I'm reading a ton. And I just read a stunning paper on menin inhibition from Gaius Issa at MD Anderson, a fellow who trained in my lab as a, um, a postdoctoral student. And it just inspired me the way I, you know, first reading about a Um Now our field has turned over every oncoprotein stone and we've almost drugged them all. We'll get there eventually with new chemistry and biotherapeutic approaches. But every time we encounter immediate or eventual resistance, chronic myeloid leukemia is just the exception to the now rule defined by the experience of developing targeted therapies in cancer, and patients rightly expect better. We all do. So Kathy, how are we going to improve the performance of targeted therapy amidst all the challenges of tumor heterogeneity, advanced disease, uh, resistance just seems inevitable. Um, yeah. How will we get there? Yeah, no, absolutely. That That is a big, big challenge for our field. And one of my, my favorite papers that came out in 2022 by Marita et al., it was a beautiful um, AML single cell analysis paper looking longitudinally in patients uh, before, during, after different therapies. And basically the results are exactly as we would have predicted, right? That the, the tumors respond in response to the drug that's targeting certain cell types and then other cell types that are insensitive to the drug expand. And we know from many years of, of work by Irv Weissman and, and, and many others that those mutations are already there. They're just at very low levels. And now we've created this environment in the presence of the drug for them to be able to expand and take over. And so I'm quite hopeful with some of the new techniques uh, looking at the chromosomal inst instability, the chromothripsis, say that word 10 times fast, um, as well as other kinds of chromosomal uh, deviations um, that we will get better at um, detecting and, and you have to be more sensitive at detecting those mutations that exist before the therapy and are likely to grow out after the therapy. Now, the other thing that this paper showed, which is terrifying, is how unique every single patient, every single tumor is. And so one patient's response is not similar to another patient's response. And so it's very challenging to predict what that resistance is going to look like in everybody. Um, but we have to start somewhere. And of course, in AML, it's a lot easier to get this kinds of longitudinal, very informative data. But recently at AACR, people are starting to collect this kind of data in, in solid tumors. Um, and so we can start to build a map of here are the most likely um, resistance mechanisms that will happen on a particular uh, therapy. And that is then something we should be already working on in the preclinical space, right? So that we have these different options available for patients, knowing that each one is just going to be another option to keep 
and prolonging that patient's life with a good quality of life. Um, so I think um, it's a combination of a lot of things um, as we learn more about um, how these tumors respond to the therapies we're giving. Now, of course, IO is the promise of being able to cope with lots of heterogeneity. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we've put a big bet on in Takeda is focusing on leveraging the innate immune system. We've already heard about in K cells. We're also looking at gamma delta cells, both from a cell therapy as well as a cell engager point of view. And we're counting on that innate ability to recognize tumor versus normal, that this is an abnormal cell that should be killed and gotten rid of to kind of deal with some of that natural heterogeneity that we don't really understand and don't have a way to go after. So um, that's where we're you know, focusing a lot of our efforts right now, but I think a lot of that other kind of analysis over time um, for how patients respond to therapies is what we're gonna have to, to as a field, uh, work on. Well, thank you. Um, I heard um, think truncal, um, think early, think in combination, and really know the patient. And um, so as not to only focus on small molecules. Rahan, I wonder if I could ask you a question about another modality, um, antibody drug conjugates. Um, here is a modality that I find very interesting because it has a truly massive denominator and a very small but very important numerator of successes. I mean, they're finally emerging as first world therapeutics. I can only imagine how many HER2 ADCs Genentech made in the day. What's your forecast for these medicines and this platform and, and how can we better develop them with data? Yeah, that's great, Jay. And, and just before I kick off a little bit, I, just to comment on one thing Kathy said, I agree with it. And I think there's also this need to understand non-genetic mechanisms of resistance and better understand them. Um, because they tend to predominate, you know, particularly when we're going off to very specific targets. Um, so with that said, I think the ADC is really interesting. I think three years ago, uh, when I was on this panel, we were asked what our prediction was in terms of the most, uh, you know, the technology that's going to make the biggest bang over the next few years. And luckily, I said ADCs. And I think, I, I, I think I'm probably right that it's made a tremendous impact, I think, in the last two to three years. Um, so, so look, I think the general view uh, is, is very positive. Um, obviously at the moment, given, you know, of course, you know, significant M&A and deal activity, but of course, you know, also phenomenal efficacy results, uh, you know, coming out, for example, last year's ASCO and HER2 standing ovation, it's amazing. So, you know, it's, it, it's sort of, and I'd be interested in what, what other people view is here. You know, the question is, is do we have the formula really today now to understand what makes a great ADC. And, and as I've spoken to folks, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that it's, it's not that clear cut, right? You know, we've definitely made tremendous progress in understanding, you know, all of the various different elements of an ADC, you know, linkers, conjugates, you know, toxins, exactly what antibody, uh, you know, construct you actually want. Uh, but there isn't a winning formula. It's very nuanced, very context specific. Uh, and so what you're now seeing, which I think is a good thing, is intense activity in the field, a lot of activity against some pretty common targets, but where people are actually modulating very selective components of the construct. And it's gonna be really interesting, I think, to see how the landscape plays out. I think for sure it's gonna grow significantly. Um, but I, what I think we're probably going to end up with is some new targets that yield to some new ADC constructs. We're going to have some existing targets yield, I think, to better constructs. Uh, and net-net, I think we're going to see a lot more ADCs in pretty much every major indication. And, you know, as I've spoken to investigators, I think it's going to open up a little bit of a problem and a challenge. Uh, because with these very targeted agents, the question is going to be, how do you pick patients for each agent if they don't have an upfront means of selecting. So if you're a lung cancer trialist today and you have her two ADCs, her three ADCs, you know, DLL3 ADCs, all of these ADCs coming at you, all of them say we work broadly in a pretty big selection of patients. You know, how do you triage patients to the appropriate drug? 
And I think this is going to put a lot of pressure on our ability to come up with ways, both invasively and minimally invasively, uh, you know, ways that are more accurate to require less tissue than today's current means uh, to get an assessment of patients up front and then triage them to the antibody that they're most likely going to respond to. Thank you. Um, all right, let's take a couple questions um, from our audience. Um, I see a question here from Christina Troyal Hansen. Christina, can you turn on your camera and um, and bring your question forward? Absolutely. Thank you for a great panel here and a great job, uh, job Jay. So my question is a little bit in a, uh, what we just heard from uh, from Kathy and, and, and Rehan. So I've been really excited about all the developments in understanding, you know, spatial transcriptomics, chromatin structure, epigenetics, and how we use all of these, you can say, informations on top of each other to optimize our cell products or understand biology more. But my question is more, when are we going to, you know, see the transition to also use that in patient selection? And, and how likely is that we can actually implement these technologies in, in what I will call precision immuno-oncology? I love that. Um, at least I can't help but look at you. I mean, you guys took out the big shotgun to develop PD-1. If you were to do it all over again with precision in mind and measurements, what does precision immuno-oncology look like? And Frank, I'd love to hear your thoughts as a um, I'm ready to go. Yes, I'll let this start. Okay, I'll, I'll, I, I, I agree with everyone else. I think the problem with the next generation immuno-oncology has been we haven't been able to select <clears throat> the right patients. And, we, and, and part of me wonders whether we've tried hard enough at it. You know, we put a huge amount of resources into the PD-1 biomarker. I can't even tell you how much work went into that. It's not a perfect biomarker. There's no question about it. But it's also clear that there were indications where if we didn't have that biomarker, we probably wouldn't have gotten um, efficacy or known how to select those patients. And, and part of me wonders, I actually think, and, and Jay and Frank, you guys know this better than I do now, that in large pharma, when we do those early studies, we're collecting all of this, these, this biomarker data. The question is, if you're not seeing a lot of responses in phase one, do you really spend the time going through that data? And then do you have the wherewithal to go check the next hypothesis, knowing that chances are that hypothesis might not be right, it might be by chance. And so I think we've really got to think hard about the effort we put into the biomarkers um, and go in with some pre, you know, hypotheses up front try to enrich for those patients, and maybe it'll help us in some way get to a better place. Well said. Frank, thoughts? Yeah, just uh, creating molecular disease maps is, is sort of the other side of the coin of the modality explosion we are witnessing, because this is basically what, what it means to unlock undruggable biology in real time, ideally in patients. And, uh, you know, we've started with single cell immunology disease maps, and applied that to IO and, and INI and, and neuro diseases. And, and the next big frontier is to go into other cell types, uh, including uh, neoplastic cells, and, and to create these um, cell maps uh, where, where a cell is the smallest physiological unit of, of, of what, what a pathology looks like. And, you know, we all, we've called it, you know, to atomic resolution because uh, that's what uh, an atom of physiology looks like. It's a cell, um, and and that's that's incredibly exciting. We, when we build uh, these these um, uh, setups, uh, the big question is: Can you get this into the clinical and do this on a, on a routine basis before uh, you get it to a, a patient, uh, a hospital near you? And 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 that requires, and I think Alice, you um, mentioned that a, a change in culture and paradigm in the develop early development space. Um, uh, put these single cell maps as a must have and not a nice to have. And, and think about early clinical development as a learning experience as much as a faster, cheaper, faster better, cheaper uh, uh, experience. And, and, and that is a whole cultural change we need, we need to do. Like 20% of the budget needs to go into these types of efforts. It's a bit like your Amazon uh, and you just, you're, the, you're the best 
logistics uh, uh, enterprise and you own e-commerce, but you're not interested what your customer thinks about it. You don't want that feedback. You're not really, uh, you're, you're not, you're not investigating that. That's what I'm sometimes seeing when we get into into the clinic and and we just move these molecules forward, just simply thinking about efficacy, safety, and maybe one or two PK and PD biomarkers. And then there's this big freezer full of stuff and there's no clear agenda and, and you know, how to use this and learn uh, and, and close the cycle. Only when we do this as a pharmaceutical industry, then we have, we'll have also the tools to ultimately do what we have to do is get it to patients with a prick of a, a point. finger and, and in a hospital near you. Uh, if we don't do this in our very bespoke and very expensive clinical trial environments, how will this ever go to... Um, uh, to a, a patient in a, in a local hospital near you. It's so key to know where to invest in subsequent development as well. And we have one last question from the um, from the audience, uh, Dr. Sandeep Gupta. Sandeep, can you get your camera on and um, kindly ask your question? It will be the last question of the session. Yeah, or actually, uh, the question I had uh, in mind was more on acquired resistance, which I think has been covered by K Kathy and Katie both, as well as UJ. So I'll switch my question a little bit more and talk about, I mean, we have been very successful in discovering novel therapies, targeted therapies for sure. But I think the clinical development, early clinical development has always been a challenge because we need to work on initially in patients who, are, who have failed multiple lines of treatments. So how, uh, what are the strategies and what are we thinking about how to enhance, enhance our early drug development, uh, clinical development experience so that we, it doesn't take that long and if we fail, we fail faster rather than have to deal with patients uh, who have failed multiple lines of therapy so that's the resistance becomes even more, more of an issue. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you think on this because actually more early clinical drug development is done in academia through investigator initiated studies. And we don't often listen to that community in industry, uh, not enough at least. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, how to better direct um, first into human to phase 2A clinical development? Katie? Well, you know, our actually our cell therapy uh, programs are all in multiple relapse and very um, uh, uh, patients with, with highly progressive disease. We face the same challenges in that uh, FDA also, at least in the setting of cell therapy, um, uh, mandates that we treat patients that have failed two or three lines of standard of care treatment. For instance, our recent uh, recent car and cage study where we wanted to include patients with acute myeloid leukemia, we were specifically told to remove those from our cohort because patients with AML have other alternative treatments, despite the fact that we'd already said only we'll, we'll recruit patients that have uh, found two different lines of uh, treatment. And FDA said you can only then go and amend the protocol once you've had three complete remissions in other disease settings. So it, it's, it's hard. I can see FDA's point, of course, if it's something that's never been tested in patients, they want to, um, and, and the safety is improving, they want to have that kind of safeguard of patients. But on the other hand, when you have a patient who fa who's found 11 line, different lines of treatment, including two transplants, which is actually the kind of patients that we are currently tre treating on your NK cell therapies, it makes the whole thing more challenging. I think this needs dialogue with the FDA. Well said. I, I can't imagine anyone on this call, Sandeep, not having a strong opinion about how we can do early development better because it's an important platform, not just to pressure test the medicine, but to set up success in phase two. And phase two success rates in cancer are woefully underperforming. Um, all right. Well, I, I regret to say that we're out of time. I'm going to turn this back over to our um, fearless and um, handsome moderator, Andy Plump. Um, <laughs> thank you all for being with us today. Thank you to the panelists uh, for joining and for sharing your thoughts so freely. Thanks so much. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you, you, thank you, Jack. Thanks to the whole panel. Really, I, I think the, a good balance of the excitement of what's happening in oncology with the reality. And if I if I just go in reverse to three or four years ago for the same panel. It was all just hype. 
around what was emerging in cell therapy and immuno oncology. And I think we've seen over the years um, some reset, but still a lot of potential. And, lot, and great, great, really great panel. So let's let's open it up to our audience, and let's if we could please bring up the polling question. So what will cause the biggest change in clinical trials in oncology? A, dose optimization guidance, B, accelerated approval guidance, or C, FDA guidelines regarding clinical trial diversity. So we'll look forward to the audience uh, engaging in this, in this great dialogue. Thank you. The next panel, let's pull up the results of our poll, please. Oh, everything is about even here. So what will cause the biggest change in clinical trials in oncology? And we have a, we have a photo finish. Dose optimization guidance, accelerated approval guidance, and FDA guidelines regar regarding clinical trial diversity. So thank you for sharing your feedback with us.